let's go ahead and get ourselves started today. Come on, guys. What's up? We're doing good. Let's go ahead and get yourself started. And today, we're going to do really a big focus for today. We're going to do some techniques about how to do the daylighting analysis. And to get there, we're going to like do it in two steps. We're going to start with really just creating some very simple surface models and show you how you can do that in a number of different ways. How you can do that either in Vasari or in Revit, or even if you have something in Rhino that you want to bring in, how we can go ahead and bring in something and really use the, the basic model of the surfaces of the building that you're going to be uh, designing, uh, you know, in any of those tools to kind of create. Well, yeah, it's, it's a fairly simple model because really when we're doing the daylighting analysis at a high level, we really just care about walls as being like individual surfaces, what the geometry is, how they're oriented, just really as individual planes. So we're going to learn to think a little more abstractly as opposed to in the real detail of what's going on and how we can even take a detailed model and pull it back, back to that level of abstraction to make it easy for the analysis. Then we'll switch over, take those models into Ecotect, where we can actually get to a lot of the detail between, behind understanding just how much daylighting is really hitting into those different surfaces and how the solar rays are bouncing off and bouncing into the depth of your building to kind of really help you with your design problem. So kind of two different chunks. The way it sort of works is we're going to go towards Ecotech because in terms of daylighting, it really has the best analysis tools and shows you more things. Vasari, which we sort of showed briefly, is a great start for getting some very, very quick answers in terms of what's going on, but when you really want to get to the depth and get the insight for your design, like Ecotech's a better place to go. But hopefully we'll show you that there's a continuum. You can start with Vasari and then move your stuff pretty easily over to Ecotech. Okay, so in terms of what you guys are doing now, if you want to open up, you can open up Vasari if you want to, or Revit. I'm actually going to open them both and kind of show you how you can do things in either tool because they really are the same tool. You just don't have to think of them that way, but the core of what's going on in each of them is really just entirely parallel. So I'm going to open up Vasari over here and I'll say, let me go create a new file and project as well. On your machines, um, the sorry is it loaded on your machines by default, but someone last class put it in, there's an R drive, yes. right? And there's a temp two, yes. okay? Yeah. And then inside there you'll find a Vasari folder. So try that. Is it temp two or something like that? Yes. And then Vasari, ah, there it is. Go ahead and open that up. And so the R temp two, then look for a folder called Vasari. And for all these different programs, we should tell you that all this stuff is uh, downloadable to your own machine. If you want to get any of the software we're playing with, Ecotech, Vasari, or Revit, just go to students.autodesk.com and you can download whatever you want and you'll get like something that'll run for three years. So uh, yeah, all the software is very freely available. Vasari's in a slightly different place. If you want to get it, it's still on a lab site. So if you just go to Google and say Vasari download, it'll take you to the place where you can download that software instead. Yes? What was the website that we could download it at? Oh, just students.autodesk.com. Okay, that's where you need to go to to get like free access to all the stuff. And really, it's all there. 3ds Max, all the Revit, the Maya, the, you know, it's all hanging around out there. So you have very free access to all the software we have available. Okay, so if you want to open up Vasari, it looks like a lot of you have it open right now. That's fine. I'm also going to open up Revit, just to kind of have it in the background here. And I will open up a new project over there. And I, what I really want to show you is that, you know, in terms of what we're doing, and open a new Vasari project. It's going to be very, very parallel. Because it turns out the sorry really is just the conceptual massing model of the environment that's built in the Revit, kind of abstracted and put under a separate tool just to make it easy to get to without having to download all of Revit to make it available. But the basic environment you're looking at here has, oh, it's basically a work plane we're modeling on. You see some different levels that have been set up. It's basically like our playing field where we can start creating and drawing different forms. And that same sort of environment is actually available over in Revit too. But let me just kind of show you it here, and I'll show you how you can do the puzzle thing over there. Okay. In working with this, it all really starts with the notion of masses. And masses are really just forms, different shapes, different types of geometry we create, where the different surfaces of the mass are really what we're going to use to do our analysis to sort of understand each of those surfaces will be understood as having a, either being a solid surface that light can pass through, or a clear surface that light, or vice versa. Solid that it can't, and a lot of, uh, clear surface that light can pass through. If we're interested in it thermally, we'll think about what the thermal properties are. We're going to focus mostly on the daylighting above here. 
And as you get started, it really is pretty easy to get going with drawing things. And if you're familiar with almost any sort of sketching tool, it works very similarly. It starts with just creating a mass. So I'm on the Model tab, and I'll say Create a Mass. Within there, I have some different drawing tools that are available. I can go ahead and draw lines or kind of uh, uh, draw uh, regular geometric shapes. Let me go ahead and just draw a little rectangle here on the playing field. What happens is as I complete a shape, any sort of closed loop, it'll go through and create a surface. And if I click on that surface, I can then start pushing and pulling and extruding it. Okay, and extrusion is probably the most simple operation that we tend to do a lot of. So once you go through and create that shape, you can kind of keep on pushing and pulling on it. You typically hit a surface, you choose a surface, and then you can sort of push and pull to kind of keep on reshaping it. Let's see if you can kind of get some basic just sort of a volume down there. If you want to go through and control those volumes, we can go ahead and keep on pushing and pulling, or if you want to give it a little more numerical control, you can choose something and little temporary dimensions will show up, and you can type in values. For example, if I know I want that to be 30 feet tall, I'll just type that in there. If I know that I want the building to be, oh, 50 feet deep, I can type that value in there. Again, it's always selecting a surface and then filling in the temporary dimension to kind of push or pull it back. The work plane. Yep, that's, that's the work plane. And what's happening if we kind of keep on working and we, we can start drawing on top of that roof surface. That's what's going on up there. Okay, so we can kind of do that to any of these surfaces. You can take these surfaces and not only just sort of like uh, push and pull the surfaces, you can also go ahead and start manipulating the edges. So you could go ahead and if you want to create more of a kind of a sloping roof, pull something like that up. Okay. Or if you really want to so go ahead and have some fun, you can even go ahead and grab individual points and as you start pushing and pulling on those, you start having very kind of complex curve surfaces as it goes through and tries to sort of uh, yeah, honor all those different edge conditions and still create a solid surface that maps between them. Okay, so it all starts just with pushing and pulling. Okay, and that's enough to get us uh, started in terms of an overall form. We're gonna kind of keep on working on that form some more in just a second here. But let me go ahead and show you how that same basic thing operates in Revit, because it's really just the same operation. I'm going to go over to Revit, for people who are familiar with that. Over here, I have the main project modeling environment that some people are familiar with. The massing environment here shows up under massing and site. And in this tool, if I say in place mass, which is going to be like create mass, what we were just looking at in Vasari. It's going to warn us that, hey, typically masses aren't shown. Typically masses are invisible to us, okay? Because usually we're using them as like construction forms that we don't want to see. Do you want to make them visible? And I'll say, sure, let's make it visible so I can see what's going on. I'll give it a name. Um, and looking at it in a plan view, I can just as easily switch over to a 3D view. Actually, let me pop that back because what's happening are two toolbars that look amazingly like each other. So I'm clicking on the wrong one. There's my 3D. I will again just go through and draw some sort of surface in there. In this one, it doesn't automatically close the, uh, in Revit, it doesn't automatically make the surface for us. We have to go through and choose the profile and say, make a form out of it. But we're back to, this is exactly the same as it is in uh, Vasari. I can push and pull and deform those things. It's really just the same environment in terms of what's going on. Okay, so as you go through and make your overall shape, which is what we'll start with, we're going to go through and think about the characteristics of the surface where the windows and the openings are in just a second. But as you create your overall shape, extruding is probably the most common thing you do. Often we'll just kind of lay down a footprint and sort of push and pull it up and maybe do some, some bending and kind of like tweaking it a little bit. But there's some other operations that are really useful for you too. So let me go back over to Vasari. I'll demonstrate them over here. So extrusion works very well, and your extrusion can be sort of oh, much more complicated than this. For example, if you have a shape that has, oh, some sort of like curvaceous surface across <laughs> the front, so I got some groovy spliny thing that's doing something like that, and let me go ahead and close that out. See if I can get that. Let me say make a solid form out of that. 
Okay, there it goes. Actually, it's sort of an interesting thing that's happening right now. You'll notice that down here in the bottom, we're actually getting a little bit of choice. Whatever as far as bizarre or whatever the concern is, a little ambiguity, if you want to create sort of an extruded surface or just a flat surface, it'll give you a choice. Okay, so in that case, it's basically asking, do you want to do the extrusion or just make that single flat surface? I'll go ahead and say make that surface. Okay, and that surface is, it's pushable and pullable, kind of the same way other things are. It's always a little bit strange though when you're pushing and pulling on surfaces that aren't sort of strictly orthogonal about what's going to happen, a little hard to control. So it may be better to go back and edit the sketch in those times. You know, it's going to, you have to sort of choose which way you think is better. But you can go ahead and sort of extrude things in most any way. Other sort of operations that are useful for you are if you want to go ahead and add on to a surface. For example, I got this big old sort of rounded surface kind of hanging around out here. If I'd like to go through and put a little L off the side or put something over here that's an extension heading out in this direction, something like that, what you can do is go ahead and just add to it. To do that, it kind of works like it does in SketchUp. What you're going to do is I'm going to draw some more. So I'm going to draw some profile. Let me go ahead and I'll just draw a profile. Oh, and as I'm drawing, I have the choice, am I going to draw on the work plane or am I going to draw on a surface? And that's what that choice is right there. And I'm going to choose to draw on a surface because I want to actually draw on this plane over here. I'll compose something like that. And then I'll have something I can kind of push and pull out and do that too. So the game to this is really going ahead and trying to come up with your overall form. And coming up with your overall form, sometimes you'll be able to use a single operation, sometimes we'll kind of keep on adding little bits and pieces to kind of like continue making the form the way you want it. Another really good operation you need to think about is how you subtract things, because sometimes the easiest way to get the surface you want is to actually cut out a surface from a volume from another one. So for example, let's take a look at how that would work. For example, over in here, if I wanted to go ahead and I'll have some little intersecting cylinder thing or something like that, I'm going to flip this back to just more of a wireframe view so I can sort of see inside of it. I'm going to go through and, oh, I'll make like a cylinder. I'll grab this guy. I'm going to draw it down on the work plane. Okay. Oh, let's talk about that. As you go placing, there's always this idea of really what are you drawing on? You can go ahead and choose one of the existing levels, like level one, level two, or level three, or you can go ahead and pick a point. So if I want to draw on this surface, I can pick and choose that surface. And sort of be really explicit about kind of quickly changing what the working plane is considered to be. I'm just going to draw this on level one, though. And I'll say, okay, I'm just going to put a little uh, kind of cylinder down in there. Now, for this guy over here, let me go ahead and choose it. I'm going to say, as opposed to extruding it up as, hang on, I'm going to grab that again, a solid form. There it is. I'm looking at the wrong menu. <laughs> it's void. <laughs> per, per your point. <laughs> I'll choose void form as opposed to a solid form. In this case, it went ahead and kind of pulled it on up there. Let me kind of rotate that around. That wasn't exactly where I had it in mind. I was thinking more in the corner. It's a little bit hard sometimes when I'm drawing in 3D to get things uh, located where I want them to. Let's see if I can get that void form. Void forms are always a little hard to grab. Okay, there it is. Let me move it around. Oh, got to find my move tool. Everything's looking a little different there in terms of geometry, work plane, modify form element. Dimension. There it is, modify. Jeez. When, when the menus collapse on me, I have a hard time finding things. There we go. So we can sort of move that around. Or if I want to. Oh, it looks like that's even kind of badly done. I'm sort of floating around in space right now. Looks like when I was drawing that, I was already up pretty high in terms of what's going on. No worries. What I should do is just to kind of get that down on the uh, plane the way I want it. Let me go ahead and select that entire form. I'm going to do that by tabbing to grab the whole thing. I'm going to tab on that one and control click to get them both. And now I'll move that whole thing on down. Okay, that's a little bit better. So, yeah, if there is a caution to this, it's you sort of watch out where you're drawing things because uh, it's easy to sort of get things in the wrong space in 3D space. But 
Go ahead, and it's really all about just kind of creating these different surfaces. Okay, so let's stop there for a second in terms of what's going on. Is the idea of sort of extruding things and kind of making the data, that sort of resonating, that feeling pretty good? Okay, great. Let's kind of show you kind of some other little tricks you can do in terms of creating these things. The light isn't all extruding. Sometimes you want a lot of things that are running on the, the drafting machine. But in terms of what you want to do, we can blend things, we can revolve things, we can sweep things in a lot of different ways we can go ahead and create forms. So let's think about some of the ways you do that. Because it's all here. It's just sort of implicit about what you have to do. Okay, so anytime you give it a profile and you say make it a form, it'll try to extrude it. That's the basic idea of that. Okay, if you go ahead and give it two different profiles, okay, it'll try to blend things together. Okay, so let's show you what I mean. If you come on over here, and I'm going to do this in the top view just because it'll be a little bit easier to see what's going on, and I'm going to draw a box and I'll put it on level one. Now let's kind of get it down on the ground. I'll draw a box down here on the ground, and then I'm going to draw another box, or it can be something not like a box, it could be a circle or something else, it'll be a harder blend. I'll put it up at level three or level four, and I'll draw another shape like this. Okay, let me go ahead and rotate that back up to 3D so you see it a little bit better. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I want to grab that one. I'm going to tab to get the profile. I'm going to grab that one. I'm going to like try tabbing to get, or control clicking to get that one. I'm going to say create a solid form out of that. Okay, and it will make a blend out of those two things. Now, once you've gone ahead and created the blend, you can still go ahead and push and pull on it and do all the direct uh, manipulation things. I can push that in or pull it up or whatever it is. But I just want you to start thinking very freely about how you go through and create your forms. Okay, so if I want to get that top surface and pull it up higher. Whatever it is you want to do. And blending can really get sort of incredibly complex in terms of what you want to do. So you guys sometimes have to think creatively about the best way to get things. Sometimes the best way to get things is instead of extruding, maybe to do a sweep or something like that. For example, let me give you an example where that might be useful. Well, what I'm going to do is, oh, we'll create sort of a big sweeping building that has kind of, kind of a rounded shape that has kind of an unusual profile to it. And what I'm going to do is as follows. Let me go through and I am going to finish that mass. Actually, no, I don't even have to finish the mass. Let me just draw a reference plane. Actually, that's a reference line. That's not what I want. Let me finish this out. Okay. We're going to go through and create ourselves a reference plane. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a plane that I can draw on. That's all I'm really after. Although I can do this on almost any vertical surface. Okay, and there's my plane. And if I want to, I can even give that a name. I'm just going to call this like to draw some vertical profile. Okay, and if I want to draw something on there, what I'm going to do is I will, actually I can do it even after I'm in there, let me say create a new mass. What I'm going to do is, oh, say that I'm going to draw something and I will um, set the working plane to be draw a vertical profile. And that'll just basically say I'm going to draw on that surface. So what I'm going to do here, I was just going to go through and draw something that's a little more complicated in terms of what's going on. Maybe I'll put some sort of rounding on it. And I'll go down and finish it out. So again, this may not be a very sort of uh, interesting or appropriate building form, but uh, It'll give you a sense of what you can do. Okay, So if I have a profile, that's one piece of it. If I have a profile and I put it together with a path, okay, I can do a sweep. So what do I mean by that? Let me go through and I'll just draw a reference line that'll look something like this, a nice arc. I'll just put it down on the floor. Actually, I'm not sure I got that on the floor. Let me see if I did or not. Nope, I don't. That's in 3D. Let me be more careful. Exactly. Let me do that again. Let me say put it on level one. That'll put it on the floor. So sometimes my mouse gets ahead of my brain. There you go. Okay. Now, with that profile and that path, what you can do is choose that profile and that path. And if you go through and create a solid form out of that, 
Oh, don't do that to me. You should be able to do that. I gotta think about why it's not doing that. Because if you want to perpendicular to the line, it's too oblique to your line, no? Oh, that may be. Let me do it the other way, which is actually, because I know this will work. Let me draw the path first. <laughs> oh, this should work. Then I'm going to go through and I'll draw the model lines. And what I want to do is I'll do a pick. And then I can pick that plane on the end. Okay, let's try this. This should definitely work, but we'll see. Okay, and we get a sweep that way. So, again, just be thinking about whatever way it's going to be easiest for you to go ahead and create your things. And sometimes it's looking from the top and extruding up. Sometimes it's actually easier to kind of draw things in profile and sweep them back. It's kind of really whatever is going to be the easiest way for you to go through and get things. Because it's all really about getting those, just getting those surfaces going. Let me get rid of that one, since it's not doing us much good. But alas, that's just kind of getting you going here. Now, okay, you can go through and create your things, uh, your surfaces in Basari or in Revit. If you already have a lot of time invested in creating some really groovalicious like a uh, rhino surface and you want to bring that all over a SketchUp surface, here's what you got to do. Okay. If you go ahead and just import a rhino surface, okay, for example, if I come out and I go to uh, under, uh, oh, I got to find it in here. It's hiding for, again, it's, everything hides for me in like uh, this tool. I know where they all are in Revit, but I always have to find them in here. Oh, actually, in here it's not even a menu tab, it's just import. <laughs> okay, if you say that you want to import a CAD drawing, and you go out and find some Rhino file. Here's the deal. If you create a file in Rhino, go ahead and what you want to bring is not your incredibly detailed model that has all the two wall surfaces and all the windows cut into the great detail. You want to get the big forms. We're sort of working in big forms. So whatever it is, is that underlying geometry that you use to generate that shape. Okay, that's what you want to bring across. And when you want to bring it across as an SAT file, and you may even want to bring it across in separate pieces because... file? Yes. SAT is the file format that it likes. Okay, so if I go over here and I go to my SAT files, someone, oops, hang on. Documents. There we go. Yesterday I was working with someone in the hallway who gave me a Rhino file to go ahead and bring across. So let me just kind of bring it in and show you how it works. I'm going to say it didn't do a very good job about knowing what the units were, so I'm going to be explicit about that. Say OK. I'm going to bring it in here. Looks like it was a very small file. <laughs> okay. But here's the deal about Rhino files. Okay. Or just even SketchUp files, the same thing. Same thing with DWG. All these things have the same thing. If you just go ahead and bring them in, they have this funny quality to them. You can see it. Looks pretty good. But you kind of can't touch it. You can see, but you can't touch. And I know in your heart of hearts, what you want to do is explode that thing and be able to get to it, because that seems like it'd be the thing that you would do. Okay? But it doesn't. It just, when it explodes, it, it's out of there. So exploding doesn't actually work with those brought in files that way. Which, here's what you got to do that will make it work, though. Okay? As opposed to just importing them directly, it's going to sound a little bit weird, but hopefully it'll make sense after it's there. If we go through and we create a new mass, okay? Open up the massing environment. If you bring in something into a mass, this will work in Revit too, okay, and then bring in the file, then complete the mass, what happens is the mass does this wonderful thing. It sort of shrink wraps the shape, okay? And it'll make mass surfaces out of the rhino surfaces. Okay, and that's the key to making this work. So what you do is, again, I've just created a mass, not much, you know, only difference was that I opened up a mass to do this. So create mass. I'll say import. I'll go out there and import that CAD thing again. I'll get the other one this time. I'll say it's meters to make it a little bit bigger, just so I can see it. Okay, there it is. Okay, it's still sort of in that look but can't touch state right now. But if I go through and say finish the mass, okay, now I actually can touch. Those are real surfaces that I can start playing around with and that I can transfer over and start using for the daylighting analysis and whatever it is I want to do. Okay, so, so that's the trick. Just always remember to do that one step of indirection through the mass and you'll bring them in. It'll work for DWGs and SKPs too.
Okay, so, but again, keep it simple. I don't want to see all your surfaces, although your surfaces can have the holes. You can go ahead and have holes where the windows are and all that type of stuff. That's good, because we want to know where the openings are. Well, we can add them here, either way. But, you know, don't necessarily worry about getting all the double walled ones where you have all the mullions articulated and all that type of stuff. Try, the simpler you keep it, the better. Okay, in terms of transferring that across. Okay. So that's just basically getting your models across. And that's okay for the general forms, but let's think about now, okay, how we actually sort of put you know, openings in these things and uh, start articulating a little bit more. Okay, so there's a couple of ways you can do this. We're gonna show you at the highest level what you do is you just say, hey, we're gonna apply a numerical percentage to the entire blob of the building and say a certain amount is solid, a certain amount is glazing, and at a high level just do that. The second level will be, okay, well, what if we actually want to change an individual surface and kind of say, you know, this one has a different percentage than the rest of the building, okay? And the third level will be, we'll actually go in and start really carefully saying where the openings are on an individual surface versus using the numerical as a early note, okay? So that's where the three steps are going to be, and that's really how you do it kind of like in these tools. So it starts with this notion of, if you go to the Analyze tab, We'll say enable the energy model, and then go to energy settings. Okay, so here's the deal. If you click on the part that says create an energy model, a couple things I want you to do. One is, there's this notion of something called a perimeter offset. The perimeter offset, it's really more important for us from a thermal standpoint than it is from daylight. Because what that's all about is that, and it's true, and it's good, this room's a good example of it. In most buildings, from the outside wall at some distance in, around 15 feet, we'll hit some sort of an interior wall or some sort of break in the building where over here is really determined by the window and the outside climate conditions. Past that point is probably determined by interior conditions, what's happening with hallways and connections to other rooms. That's what that's all about. Okay. For our buildings, we don't really want that interior wall. Most of your buildings are more open air, connected to the outside. For you, I'd set that to zero, and as opposed to zoning the building, it'll treat the whole building as one big zone. Okay, so that's what the difference is there. So, actually, I'll, let me do it once with it on, and then we'll turn it off, and you can sort of see what the difference is. The second choice is, is really, what is the target percentage glazing? And it says glazing, we're gonna show you how you can make it not glazed, but actually just an open air connection as opposed to a glazed connection. But we'll leave it called glazing for now. That's just where to put the openings. And we can sort of put some value in there. We'll say that, oh, we want to put, oh, 35% glazing in there. We have the target sill height, that is, as it's going through an automatically placing windows, how about to put them off the ground? And it turns out that's not going to be a really critical number in terms of what's going on. Well, from thermally it isn't, from daylighting it is more important in terms of how things are bouncing around. We also have the notion, is the glass shaded? Let me leave that off for now. We also have the notion, are there any skylights on the roof? Zero percent would be no skylights. If you put a percentage in there, it'll automatically put some skylights in. So let me say maybe 5% of the roof is going to be covered with skylights. And you can even sort of put in here this notion of, if there are skylights, are they going to be little three by three skylights? We're going to put a lot of them scattered uniformly across the roof, or it's going to be like a 10 by 10 skylight, and there'll be fewer of them in more concentrated locations. So you get to kind of choose some overall settings. Again, don't sweat it. We'll go ahead and customize this, but this will get us going. Say OK. And it's interesting. I always used to think this would just automatically pop into the, mo pop into the model, but today I'm having trouble with it, so I'm going to actually say analyze the model and it'll do the analysis at that point in terms of subdividing the model. It needs to make some changes. Say yes. Well, I know what it is. Actually, I know it's causing that now. It's because of the mass floors. Warning. That's okay. I say continue with that. Let's let it go off and do something. Some things about the perimeter zones it didn't like. Let's go ahead and let's answer some questions there. So, oh, what you need to do is go ahead and log in. Do you have a Rodesk account right now? Then let me go ahead and give you a log in for right now. And you're welcome to the wrong line. 
Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at what it did over here. Let me uh, switch over to this thing where, oh, let me shade it again so you can sort of see it. And I'll say show the mass surfaces. At a really high level, here's what it did. If I gave it that 35 percentage, okay, what it's done is as followed. Okay, it went ahead and took our building and it broke it up into zones. This is the 15 foot zone on the outside. Looks like it did a pretty bad job over there. I'll think about what happened over there. See, it's sort of putting these interior walls. Yeah, that's what I want to turn on because I don't want to have those, you know, blocking the air, blocking the air, all more gold. So when I turn off the perimeter zones, and we'll lose that separation of what we think about it as one big space. Dividing the parameter zones, that's this issue. What it does is when it says divide it, it tries to say, hey, the northeast corner is going to be different than the northwest corner is going to be different than the southeast and the southwest. So it sort of tries to break it up into subsections, which again, thoroughly is sort of more important because we have sort of different climate conditions depending on how the sun's going to be to those different corners. So these windows, that's all 35% covered at two foot six above, and just one giant window that's covering 35% of the area. So that's how we got to here in terms of what's going on. And it did it to all the different buildings. You see all those little three by three skylights kind of scattered around all over the top of the building. This one did sort of a very strange job in terms of breaking that up. Okay, but what we're going to do is I'm going to change my settings around just a little bit. I'm going to say, hey, no perimeter. That'll turn that off. <coughs> I'm going to say okay to that. It's complaining about uh, one of my buildings is defined a little strangely. Okay, and we have all that kind of general area in terms of what's going on. That's looking a little bit better. Let me try this. I'll just focus on that building back there because that's kind of a pretty good example. For this A building over here, or even this one over here, let's think of that one, you have this notion of do we want to stick with that 35% for every surface or do we want to actually start customizing it a little bit? Okay, and this is where as you start designing, okay, you want to start thinking about what the surface features are in each of the different like areas. For example, this end wall over here, if I want to start changing that around so it's not just 35%, but it has something a little more custom to it, what I can do is as follows. Up in here, there's this notion, are you showing me zones or showing me surfaces? So make sure you're showing surfaces. That'll show you like brown surfaces versus clear surfaces. If you're looking at sort of a, you know, kind of translucent greeny thing, that means you're showing the zones. So go to surfaces. And then what you want to do is the first click would just grab the entire building. What I want to do is hover over an edge and tab once, or tab twice, see if you can grab just a surface. Okay, because if you can grab just a surface, we'll start to see the settings for that surface. Okay, so for the green over there, go ahead and flip it over back to uh, mass surfaces. It's one over to the left in the ribbon there. Beautiful. Okay, see if you can get the brown surfaces, and then if you can choose that surface, what you want to do is, oh, I got the surface. We can say that over here under the energy model, do you want the values to be determined by the energy settings, that's the overall defaults, or do you want to sort of customize it for your specific surface? So this is that first level of customization, just must customization just for that surface. I can say, you know, I want that one to be 50%. I want a lot of window over there, and it's going to be at like, you know, five feet off the ground. Okay. You can also decide on that individual surface, do you want to put a shade on that surface? So put a two foot shade or put a five foot shading surface on there. Whatever it is, or a 20 foot shading surface if you have a big old awning that's kind of covering part of the marketplace. So you can start really adapting and kind of changing and customizing all the individual surfaces separately. Okay. And that's really like the first level of control you have over trying to get a little bit finer about where you're going. Let's try this one. This is kind of a groovy surface over here, this big old rounded one. So maybe this is the front of my marketplace. I'll go ahead and change that one by surface. Let's say, oh, it's four feet off. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and say that, oh, it's only about 20% on that side, and we'll put a shade on there that's maybe eight feet deep or something like that, whatever it is. 
Okay, and it'll sort of follow that. And that's okay as a first level approximation about what's going on. Now, if you just want to start to sort of see at a really high level the effect of your shades versus the amount of sun penetrating into the building and stuff like that, you can even do that right over here in Basari. We don't have to even go over to Ecotech to do that. For example, we can turn on shadows. Shadows are this little button that are really right down here in the bottom of the screen. There's sun path or shadows. Shadows will turn them on and the sun path will then let us say what time of day and what time of the year. So if you turn on shadows, that'll start to give you a sense. Now these windows are huge, they're 20 feet tall or something like that, so I'm going to get gigantic shadows in here. But I can sort of orbit around and sort of see where the sunlight is actually hitting into the building. Okay. Based on this and this time of day, if I wanted to kind of keep the heat out of the building, I could say, you know, maybe for that surface over here, I need to go through and put in a deeper shade. Maybe I need to put in a 15-foot canopy or something like that to kind of keep whatever it is out of the building. So you can start to even at a very high level start thinking about how you know, some of your design decisions need to work. If you want to start adjusting the time and day, what you can do is, oh, if you turn on the sun path, you'll get this thing, the heliodon. And this is where we can start to say, you know, what is the effect at noon? This is at the equinox, actually. Let me uh, shift W, get rid of that. I can sort of say what the effect is in the morning or what the effect is in the afternoon, kind of move the sun around and kind of see what the effect is at different times of the day. Or even a really effective thing to think about is really what is the difference between being really at the solar, at the solstice, where you really have the sun very high in the sky Okay, versus, oh, during the winter time, if I switch that over to like more December, when you have these very, very long shadows and the sun's really penetrating very deep into the building at that time. Now, here in the U.S., we tend to like that effect because we like to have all that winter sun helping us to heat. In India, you may have a very different issue in terms of whether you want that sun in your building at any time or not and how you go ahead and filter that out. You can set it up, right? And go into the options. Yes. In fact, well... It does show up. You can type in India and yes. type the exact space. It will give you the Let's do that, as a matter of fact. In fact, we didn't do that. Let's set it up in here. It's right up here. This little thing that says Boston Mass right now. If we actually want to have... that, was, We should have done that. True sun conditions for India as opposed to the latitude and longitude for Boston. Let me see if I can choose that. It'll go out to Google's mapping surface. Or mapping, yeah, mapping, mapping service. Let's see if it's going to connect in there. Am I responding? It depends on where they are. My internet is working. Okay. And where are you in India? Gujarat. How do you spell that for me, please? Madasa. It might be very good. Madasa. Gujarat very M O D A S A. Thank you. I'm very bad about spelling Indian names. Okay, somewhere in there? That's it. Okay. We're 10 kilometers north. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, no worries. If we say okay to that. I'll okay. set it up to each application. Okay, now the sun that's going to come through the, based on the latitude and longitude will actually get accurate shadows. So that's a very easy thing to do, so you should do that so you get that because you don't want to be designing for Boston shadows <laughs> for your Indian environment. Okay, so again, just sort of working with the sun and the shadows. Actually, you saw how much it just jumped there for the time, and it's based on the latitude and the longitude. You can start seeing, at a real high level, just what the effect of just direct, daylight, direct sunlighting in the shadows is. Okay, now, a third kind of level to this, though, in terms of customization is, you know, this whole thing of just really at a high level saying, hey, every wall has a certain percentage, and we're going to start looking at these percentages. And, you know, that works at a sort of very basic level, but if you really want to start having more detailed control over that, you can. And what we need to do is actually sort of choose those surfaces and really say where you want the window rotations to be. So, for example, Oh, let me go back to this little end wall again, because that's actually a pretty good one to work on. It's easy for me to grab right now. I will choose that surface again. Okay, and right now it is custom. It's custom to this just surface here. But if I want to go through and actually start really thinking about it in a lot of detail where the window locations are, what I'll do is I'll start by just putting in a target percentage of zero. Okay, now let me tell you about that. 
If you go through and customize window openings in there, and you also have a percentage in there, those two things are going to kind of work together in a weird way that will be a little bit hard to predict because it'll still try to honor the percentage in addition to what you customize put in there. So I'm going to say, just make it a blank canvas to start with. Okay, that'll just make your life a little bit easier. Okay, if you want to then start putting in some custom openings, what you do is go ahead and grab that object, and you can either double click it or you can say edit in place. Either way, it does sort of the same thing. Where I need to open it for editing, so I'm just looking at the mass surfaces. This is really how we defined it. Okay, and if I want to start drawing on this surface, what I do is I choose the surface. And this is always a hard one for me to find, but it's in the geometry section of modifying. There's this little guy over here where you do something called modifying a split face. And it's this funniest little icon that looks like a cathode ray tube to me, or a little TV or something like that. But you go ahead and choose that icon. So it's up there in geometry, up towards the top. And when you choose that, it brings up a special mode that will let us just draw on the surface of that face. So what I can do now is say, you know, I want to have a window just right up here. Okay, and that's one window. Oh, let me cancel out of that. I sort of hit the return and did something weird. Let me do that again. I'm going to say that I want to put another one in right underneath it. Okay. And if I do something like that, I'll escape to get out of that mode and say finish. What's going to happen is, as opposed to the mathematically defined windows, it's going to use my custom defined windows instead. Okay, so just really think about how much you want to use that. Yeah, as a starting point, often for thermal analysis, we just use the percentages because it really is just sort of a percentage raising versus a percentage not raised. For you and your daylighting strategies, though, it is sort of more important to think about this in terms of really where the windows are, how high they're going to be, how low they're going to be. If you want more control, go ahead and put them here. But even for this, I'd say for what we're doing now, think about for every surface. Big planes of windows. Don't get into sort of modeling every last little window at that level of detail. We'll do that later on in the modeling process, but at a high level in terms of understanding, just kind of the big planes of glass for open space versus the closed spaces is probably enough to get you going. Okay, is that feeling pretty good? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Okay, that's how you do the modeling if you're doing it in the side, but really, where you want this to come out is really something as simple as this is basic surface models and do it in Vasari, do it in Revit if you want to, or do it in Rhino. Okay, either one of those, but bring it in here, through here, because we're going to make a mass surface out of it to get it over to you. Can you go right in while you did this split? Sure. Let's go ahead. I'll do it to a different surface. Okay, because again, this is that little customization thing that a lot of people want to start playing with. What I'll do is I'll grab this surface, this side, on the side. What I'm going to do is do a tab. Tab, tab, there it is. I got that surface. And I'm going to say, rather than just doing the default energy settings, what if I do by surface, and I'll put it to zero. That'll just kind of zero everything out and give me a big blank slate to work with. Okay, so that's the first step. Turn off the calculation so that's not doing that to you automatically. Then what I'm going to do is take that model, and I'm going to edit it, either by double-clicking or saying edit in place. Either way will work. And once you edit it in place, you can choose a surface. And I, oh, let me do that again. That's, that's the one that's sort of always confusing to me. Under Modify, there's this funny little tool which kind of changes a split face, or splits a face. And this is where you can go through and put in just your custom windows. Okay, and when you finish that out, what will happen, this is just kind of, Revit has these rules about in outer line versus inner line. The inner boundary inside of an outer one will be a void as opposed to the outer one creating solids. So it's, it's inner, outer. Okay, and we start to have a little bit of customization there. Okay, so this is when you're starting with just a conceptual model. Let me show you, though, kind of a, a way to complement this, and that's this, if you have a well-developed model, a model that already looks like a building, how you can go through and do this, too, because it's, it's really the same basic principle, and it's going to get back to the same place. And you'll probably want to do this after your designs are a little more developed in terms of really confirming that the daylighting is still doing what you want it to do as you uh, develop your designs a little further. But where this goes to, this whole operation, we're going to go through and do our basic 
basic modeling of the building and we're going to finish up by basically doing something called exporting it and we're going to export it to a special format. It's an XML format and it's called GBXML for Green Building XML. And what does that XML format do? All it really does is it takes your geometry here, your different XYZ coordinates and whether other, every surface is solid or glazed and exports it to a file that other uh, analysis programs can read. So I'll say mass model GBXML. We'll go ahead and export it. I'm going to just put it in my documents folder. Uh, my documents, where do they go? There they are. And I'll say NJIT, and I'll call it Daylighting 2. It's an XML format file. We'll save it away. Okay, so again, just a very simple surface geometry thing. Create it here, create it in SketchUp, Rhino, whatever it is, but ultimately we want those very simple surfaces to work with. Okay, what I like about creating it here though is even early on, the ability to kind of turn on the shadows and start playing with the Heliodon gives me some pretty good immediate feedback about how I'm doing just with daylighting coming in and how it's penetrating the building at different times of the day or different times of the year. Okay, now I'm going to switch over to Revit, okay, which is again very, very similar. There's the conceptual massing environment. Yeah, I can go through and do the same thing over here if I say um, analyze the mass model or turn on the energy settings and all that kind of stuff. It basically has the same dialogue. Everything's just pretty much the same in terms of what's going on. I can say analyze the mass model and the same thing would happen there. But I'm going to switch over to a slightly different mode, which is to say what if we actually had a building? Well, actually, let me even do that to this building here. Now I'll do it the other way. What if you've already designed a building? At some point, we can show you how you can take your mass model and turn it into a building, but that's, uh, that's another class. <laughs> okay, I'm going to create a real basic building. I'm just going to go through and put some walls down. I'm not going to worry very much about the thermal properties. I'm just going to get the, the basic building down here. Okay, I'll let me switch that over to 3D so you can sort of see what I'm up to a little bit better. In, in those walls, I'll go through and put in some windows. Okay. For some little section of that building, let me put in a big old curtain wall just so I can sort of uh, have a lot of daylight flooding in in one area. So what I'm going to do is just break that building up. I'm going to split a little section of it out. And then this little piece right there, I'm just going to replace that with a curtain wall. And again, don't worry so much about what I'm doing in terms of the design of the building. It's really I just want to show you how you can transfer this across. Okay. So there's a curtain wall right in there. Buildings need to have a floor and they need to have a roof in terms of, and even if they don't have a real floor and a roof, we have ways of sort of putting in things that sort of create that boundary because we need to sort of actually help it understand really how to create the volume of the building. So what I'm going to do is put a floor under that thing. Let me trim that up in the corner. And I'll put a floor there. Okay, and the final thing is I'm going to put a roof on this thing. And for my roof, and again, don't worry if this is flying by really quickly because, you know, we got a whole separate thing on how you do the modeling in Revit. This is just enough to kind of get a basic model in here. I'll put a three-foot overhang on it over here, here, here. I'll put it on all sides. Again, I'll trim that up just to kind of complete that. Only for this, rather than having it sort of slope up from all sides, I'm going to only have it slope up from a single side. Let me close that up. Okay. I got a basic building. Okay, this may be oh further down in your design process. You have something that looks like this, as opposed to just the basic mass forms. But the same basic principle is going to apply. We need to take this thing and make it into that basic mass surface model. So two ways to do this: if you have a building like this and it's incredibly complex and you want to sort of think about it as an overall form, you can take this and basically trace it as a mass form. Okay, so I could say. Let's go ahead and make a mass surface out of this. And then uh, basically trace the form and kind of create it that way. Another way we can do it, though, that is typically the way we do it with buildings like this, is we use the notion of a room. Because rooms have this very special property to them. This is how we used to do our energy analysis before we even had Vasari. If you go ahead and make room objects, and I drop a room object in here and say make a room out of this, 
What it does is it, from the center of the room, it reaches out and feels the walls. It feels the floor. It reaches up and feels where the ceiling is. And somehow that room object and its surfaces just happen to look an awful lot like what you need to do your energy analysis or do your daylighting analysis. So they use that as a way of actually just kind of getting to that. It's how to get sort of a, ma a surface model on the cheap is to make a room model because the surfaces of the room will actually be the, uh, the bounding surfaces that you want to use for the analysis. So what that looks like, if you already have a model, is you come on over here and you put a room in here. Okay, just drop a room in. Now let me cut a section because I'm going to give you two things that you need to do to your room to make this look right, or to make it work right. I'm going to cut a section through here. And actually, uh, towards the end, we're actually going to give you some links where you can sort of see all this incredible detail. I have like, you know, mini recordings that sort of explain how to do this. So don't worry if some of this flies by a little bit quickly, because we've got some videos that will actually kind of explain this in terms of if you miss a specific step. Because I know I'm covering an awful lot of stuff and throwing it at you pretty quickly. Okay, so I can't see my room right now. It's not really visible to me. It's actually down there. I happen to know it's down there. But I'm going to make it visible by doing something called visibility graphics. And for rooms, I'm going to turn this on just so you can see the concept I'm talking about. There's the room. It's kind of hanging down there. Here's the problem with rooms as a way of doing this. Rooms, by default, are assumed to be from zero feet, where you put them, up to 10 feet. Okay. And that kind of works okay for most rooms. Usually within 10 feet, you're going to hit a ceiling or hit another floor or something like that. But for a big old clear story space like this, you're not. Okay. So what you got to do is, if you have big old clear story spaces, is change the upper limit of the room so it's not 10 feet. You can really make it as high as you want to. Because what's going to happen is, it'll keep looking. In fact, it even wants to be higher than that. My roof, my roof is a little bit slopey here. Maybe I'll go ahead and bring that down. <laughs> Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, so I got a room, it's kind of poking on up. I know that room is gonna be high enough to actually catch the ceiling. Okay, that part's pretty good. But it hasn't quite caught the ceiling yet. It's still poking up through the ceiling. Here's what's going on. By default, what happens is, when you go through and work with Revit, and it's doing rooms for efficiency, it only does the square footage. It only says, okay, let me look in the X and Y direction. That's pretty quick. It doesn't bother looking in the Z direction, because that would take a little bit more time to compute that. Okay, so if you want to turn it on and have it look in the Z direction, easy enough to do, you just need to tell it to. Okay, and where you do that, and again, this is going to sound really weird as a place to be, but I'll give you a video that'll show you where to find it. It's under room and area. And there's something about area and volume computations where you just need to say, compute the volume as, a and, and, as well as the area. Okay, when you do that, it'll actually get a true volume in there. Okay, so again, a lot of setup just to kind of get what we want to, but it really the important thing is you got to develop model, put a room in there, and just adjust the boundaries to catch the surfaces. You'll be in good shape. Okay, that's it in terms of what we need to do. Just got to get a room in there, make that happen. If I say export this now, let me export it as a GBXML file again. That should start to sound familiar. It'll give us something that looks like this. That might look somewhat familiar to you. That kind of looks like what we were creating as a mass volume over in Vasari uh, or some other tools, and it should. That's, real, that's the simplified version of our building right now. So by default, it'll know to export the room information as the model. Exactly. That's what it does, but yeah, exactly. And let's talk about just a little bit of sort of the complexity of what's here and isn't here, because you can, it really depending on what you need, you can get much more kind of detailed or not. It has this notion of the building type. The building type really is more from the energy standpoint. The idea is some buildings are 24 seven, others are eight hours, five days a week. Based on whether this is a library versus a classroom, we have a very different density of people and different types of heating loads. So that's what that's all about. Location is going to be the latitude and longitude in the climate file. Ground plane is really a floor building. Is level one where ground is, or is level two? It's, it's if you have an underground building, or have a building that has a basement. How to think about thermally what's happening, at what level do you start thinking you're above grade versus below grade? Okay, phase, that's going to do if we have a multi phase project, we don't worry about that so much. Sliver space, that's all about if you have several rooms. How big can a gap between rooms be and still considered to be a single surface? 
Okay, so between here and the hallway, there's about six inches of dead space in there. And I don't want to think about these two separate surfaces, but I really like to think about it as a single surface. Okay, so, yeah, if it's one foot, it'll collapse those into a single surface as opposed to considering those two separate spaces, or two separate surfaces. Okay, and you see it to sort of choose how, flat, how wide it can be before it actually treats those as two meaningful surfaces. Complexity is probably the most interesting one. That's the one where you want to make sure you do this. Simple is just get the volume. Simple with shading surfaces is not only get the blue surfaces, but also start to consider the effect of all this. The roof overhangs, any sort of solar shelves and sunshades. Shading surfaces will get you in, put that into the whole shading equation. You can cash out as well. Complex really is just all about these big old curtain panels and what to do with those. A simple model treats it as like one gigantic sheet of glass. A complex model treats them as individual panes. Complex with shading surfaces will be the individual panes and also the roof over panes. Complex with mullions and shading surfaces will get all the mullions in there. And you think that mullions don't make much of a difference, because they don't just as mullions, but what's happening now will get a lot of the newer buildings going up. In the mullions, we're starting to have fins, we're having shelves, and all these things built into them that are all about deflecting and reflecting light into the building. So that's really, really good. That's a way of modeling things like screen systems. You can even do maybe some modeling where I can set up curtain systems, which are all fins and shelves and no glass. Because it's really just a really good way of modeling sort of a shading or a reflecting system, where it's all about the reading and what's going horizontally and what's going vertically. So if you look at all these new double skin facades, okay, you can model those very nicely as modeling and shading. So that's why that's there. Okay. So you go ahead, you say, hey, I'm going to go for like just, oh, I'll just go simple with shading surfaces. That'll be enough to get us going. Say next. It's going to say, where do you want to put it? I will go out and put it in that same place. Oh, my documents. I'll call it NJIT Daylighting 2. XML. Oops. Say no. It's actually 2B, because I don't want to get rid of that other one. My incredibly non-descriptive names that I won't remember for more than 15 minutes, if that. Okay, so now we have that XGV XML. So we've basically gone through the two variations. Either go through and create it in Vasari and export it as GB XML, or in Revit as GB XML, or do a detailed model and make rooms out of it and export it. But anyway, you're somehow getting GB XML out of it. Okay, so far so good? Excellent. Okay, let's go ahead and take that over to Ecotech and do something with all that. Okay, if you open up the Ecotech program, Ecotep really is, it's, it's this incredible Swiss army knife of you know, thermal and daylighting and all sorts of analysis tools. It really is you know, a very fantastic just simulation engine underneath it all. It's all based on the DOE 2.2 simulation engine. So if you're a sustainability and energy modeler, we all use basically the same uh, modeling engines. It's the same simulation system. So honestly, for any of the tools I'm showing you, Vasari, Ecotech, Green Building Studio, Equest, any of those tools, they all use the same simulation engine underneath them all. The differences in the results are really just in how well you're modeling your assumptions. Okay, because the, the math is the same underneath it all. It really, that part doesn't change in any of these different tools. You're looking at a modeling grid. The idea was with Ecotech that originally people were supposed to be going through and doing their modeling right in here. And you can do some modeling in here. You can even sort of adjust your modeling. I don't like to model in here because it's yet another drafting system and I have a hard time understanding this one. But oh, I can do things like I can put partitions and I can kind of click points and draw some vertical surfaces. And I can go ahead and put like, oh, planes down so I can kind of match those points. But I'm actually, I'll be the first to admit, I'm very poor about modeling in this environment. So go ahead and know that you can change things. Not that I want you to do all your primar modeling in here, but it's really good to know how you can sort of tweak your model here so that you don't have to always go back to the source. Okay, so I can go through and create things like that. That's my simple little box model. Oh, in my simple little box model, if I want to put a window in it, Let's see if I can get this to work. Actually, let me try this. I might have to choose that one first, then try adding a window.
There you go. Okay, there's a window in it. Now, again, I'm very, very bad at modeling in this, so I'm not going to advocate doing it, but know that you can just so that you have the ability to kind of tweak things when you want to. What I'm going to say, as opposed to modeling it in here, is go ahead and bring in your imported file and use that as a starting point because you put all that work into doing it, you might as well take advantage of it. So we'll say import the model. There's also 3D geometry. If you've come as a GBXML file, go that way. If you have just a, um, a DWG file or something that's created in sort of another CAD drafting system, you can bring it in that way. Either way it works. It's all just about getting the surfaces in. So let me bring in the model file. I have to go ahead and switch this though. It defaults to something called an MOD file, which of course I don't have any of. I'm going to go to a GBXML file, which I do have some. And I need to go out to the place where I put it. I put it out there in my documents. I'll scroll on down there and so let's see if you can open up yours. I'm going to go to that NGIT Daylighting 2. Open it up. It'll go looking for what's happening in there. The GBXML file is really just this giant text file full of a bunch of nodes and points and you can look at it. You know, it's really hard for me to make any sense of it so I don't tend to do very much in there. There's just all this information. We have all these surfaces. Talking about whether they're exposed to the sun, have it's a poly loop, there's Cartesian points that describe it, there's all that stuff. But I tend not to pay much attention to that. I'll just basically say open it as a new file. I won't save that existing one. And here is my model. Actually, there's a lot of things going on in this model because I left a lot of things in there. Okay, this is actually sort of a 3D editor view of the model, so I can make some changes to it. I can scroll around a little bit. Maybe do some panning. But that's basically the geometry that I brought in. And let me go ahead and zoom in on that building over here. Because that's the one I'll sort of pay attention to. And I have all these different surfaces in here. Now let's think about the surfaces and what you're sort of seeing. Okay, it does its best. In fact, let me, I'm going to switch over to the Visualize tab. That maybe help give you a better sense of what's going on because at least it'll fill them in as solids. Here's the scoop. Okay, the basic surfaces are hanging around in here. If they're relatively flat surfaces, if the things that kind of came in rectangular will sort of look like flat surfaces, if the things that have any sort of curvature or tweaking on them become kind of triangular. Okay. These yellow surfaces are shading surfaces. The gray surfaces are solid surfaces. All the little clear ones are clear surfaces. That's a roof over there, that's a roof over there. This one should be showing me a roof. There are graphical problems. Every once in a while it just doesn't show you things properly. We can look at that surface and see whether it really is. That's really good there. Right? <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, you bring the model in there, you start having the surfaces, and that's when it started in terms of what's going on. Okay. Over here in this environment, we should go ahead and set up a few things though to work, again, just to sort of make it familiar to us. One thing we should do is make sure we have the units that we like. So think about whether you're an SI person or an imperial person. Everyone has kind of their own preference for this. Yeah, you probably ultimately want to work in SI units. I like to work in imperial units just because I understand foot candles and I have a, a good first-hand feel for that. Don't worry, we can change over between the unit system at any time. So you can do everything imperial and switch it over to SI for reporting it or vice versa. But kind of do something that's going to give you familiar a familiar system to work with. To change that, it's under File, User Preferences. And under there, you can go through, it's under uh, Localization. You can choose whether you want to be a SI person or a US person. Okay, and you can see what the impact of that is in terms of whether it's foot candles or Lux or Fahrenheit or Celsius or whatever it is. And again, you can customize that if you want to. But I will just go ahead and leave it set to US standard for now. Another thing you should do, though, is let's go ahead and, because we're going to be looking at daylighting, set the climate and the latitude and longitude to be what they should be, because we want to get to do that. It looks like it didn't go ahead and carry that across. Let me go through and show you where you find that. You can get it in a couple of different ways. What I'll do is go into the model menu and say site and location. And in site and location, I can either go ahead and actually came up with Karachi. Well, so there you go, it's translated it. It did do it. <laughs> I take that back. It actually didn't bring in the latitude of lunch. I would, 
They made a liar out of me. Uh, but you can go ahead and put in a manual latitude and a longitude. It looks like in this case, it actually, it got that. It doesn't have a weather file right now, but it does have kind of a latitude and a longitude and even the time zone now, that's pretty good. Okay, you have this whole notion here of really what the orientation is relative to the site. Let me kind of show you that. Just if I go back over to a plan view, for example, Okay, right now it's assuming north is the upper end, south is the lower end, east and west are the left and right. If you want to go ahead and rotate things on site a little bit, uh, you know, 30 degrees off or 90 degrees off, where you would do that is you go back over in site and location and you can sort of just pull this little compass around and kind of give it a little tweak to sort of how far rotated from north you are. Okay, it's under model and then site and location. Okay, now, it's going to be okay. Because it has a latitude and longitude, it'll be okay right now in terms of daylighting. Um, we don't have a climate file set up right now. Um, so if we were going to be thinking about thermal characteristics, we'd want to go ahead and set that up. They have a climate file um, available for us. For, oh, the closest one within here, and how I got that was under weather data file. I can click on the little three dots. The closest one they have is one for New Delhi. Okay, which may or may not be, you know, the climates, the microclimates are very different. That may be different. If that's not appropriate and you have your own weather file that we can download from one of the internet surfaces. Karachi is close, actually. Oh, which one? I think Karachi. 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 Yeah, but this is the closest we've done. Karachi. Karachi. Also, and then, so, but, oh, does, is, is, do we have a weather file for Karachi in here no. or not? No. No, yeah, okay. No. Now, so what we should do is actually get a weather file. Yeah, Karachi is better in terms of the time zone and the latitude and longitude. But what we can do is we go out to the internet and find. No, it's in Pakistan. Pakistan. Oh, excellent. Oh, there it is. Fantastic. Much better. So say okay to that. Okay. Now, the climates here, you can say, do you want to update the latitude and longitude? Now, no, if you want to keep your accurate latitude and longitude. Yes, if you want to move to the Karachi coordinates. Either way, if you want to do that. Okay. So I'll just say no to that. I'll just use the weather data, but not actually change that. Okay. So we're in pretty good shape. So set up for your local conditions. Very important because the problem you're solving here in Newark or in Boston or in Palo Alto is very different than the problem you're solving uh, in India. Okay, so go ahead and set that up. Okay, you are now ready to start playing in terms of what's going on. So let me go back to that big old perspective view. And I'll even go to visualize. That might be making it a little bit easier to see as opposed to the 3D editor where everything's kind of a wireframe. Okay. Couple things we want to do in here. In general, it has done a pretty good job of bringing in what the solid versus the non solid surfaces are. Okay, so the gray surfaces are the solids, the clear surfaces are currently set to glazing right now. Now, if we want to truly make that a void, make it truly open air, because even glazing has some properties where it's cutting out some of the daylight, there's some loss and some inefficiency in that, not to worry. Here's how we do that. So you go back to the 3D editor. What I want to do is basically just grab any of the window surfaces. So for example, I want to get that window or just anything that you know is a window. Okay, and if you're having trouble selecting the window, this always sort of, this is a weird thing about uh, working with Ecotech. Ecotech uses a funny scheme where if you choose surfaces, if you want to get the adjacent one or something that's you know on the same boundary but maybe not that surface, it's not tab like you're used to sort of using in Revit or it's we have, every drafting tool has its own system. It's the space bar. Hmm. Which of course makes no sense at all, but it's the space bar. So you hit the space bar and it rotates through things. So see if you can grab one of the windows. That's all I want to do is get one of the windows. Because what I want to do is in that window, you'll see over here that here's window and it's currently set to be a single glazed timber frame window, which is kind of a wood frame window with a single pane of glass. Okay, that may be okay, but for us, it's not. We're going to make them just voids. We're going to make them just openings. So here's the easiest way to do that. You could go and select them all individually. Can do it that way. But a really quick way of doing that is if you choose one, you can choose under the little menu, select all the matching ones. And that'll grab all the windows and the skylights anywhere within the building. Okay, and once you do that, you can say, hey, I don't want those to be windows. I want them to be voids. Okay, and then I'll have the effect of kind of changing them all and just kind of do it in one quick swoop. Okay, so again, the thing to do is just go ahead and grab any window. It doesn't really matter where it is. I grab that one. 
Okay, you can say select all the matching objects. Okay, and then make sure that's set to void. There's 680 of them, I guess. <laughs> okay, and that'll just kind of really quickly get you switched over. The other surfaces, I think, are probably in pretty good shape. If you want to confirm anything, for example, oh, this wall over here is considered brick timber frame, which is sort of a wood frame wall with a brick surface. Matters thermally, doesn't matter so much from a daylighting perspective. There was this thing over here where the roof was a little bit strange. Over here, this roof looked pretty clear. Let me go ahead and grab that roof. You'll see, though, it actually is ceiling metal deck. It just sort of is appearing a little bit strangely. Yeah, there are definitely some open GL kind of graphical things where it doesn't always render properly. Okay, but you're in pretty good shape. Okay, let's go back and turn on and visualize. You get to stick around? Does anybody have a class after this, or you could stick around for a little while longer? Can you, okay. 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 I think we'll, they're good. We'll wrap you by eleven forty-five. Okay. Thanks for your patience. I'd always get too wrapped up in this and just keep on going. And like, uh, there's so much to tell you. Okay. Um, for the building, you can turn on the sun. It's under the sun tab and say display shadows. This will actually get you right back to what we were able to do in Vasari or in Revit, where we can see the shadows. And if I say show the sun path, it gets you back to the heliodon. And we're able to look at the shadows. Okay, this is exactly kind of, this is the part that got exported to Revit in terms of doing that. And if you want to start looking at the shadows, we can even do things like, oh, animate the shadows and say, let's just go through a day in the life and kind of see what happens to the shadows as you can moving on through. Okay, or we can do that throughout the year if you want to sort of see what's happening as we move from a June to December. Back out to December again. Okay, we can go to any specific date and time by oh, choosing, oh, we want to go to May and kind of see what the shadows are at that specific time. Okay, and that's pretty good as a place to get started. Let me go ahead and orbit this around a little bit. So you can start looking at shadows from that perspective, but I want to do something a little bit different. I want to give you two specific tools to work on that will specifically help with daylighting. One is this sort of notion of numerically analyzing the amount of daylighting, and the second one thinking about how the sun rays are reflecting and how you control that in your building too. So let's take a look at that. And to do that, let me turn off these shadows. And goodbye to the shadows. And I'm going to go focus on just that building back in the corner. Okay. We can do all the buildings, but I tend to like to go ahead and focus on a single one at a time to kind of really, yeah, kind of control individual things before you try and solve everything. Okay, here's what you got to do. We are going to put in something called the data analysis grid, and the data analysis grid is just basically going to give us the ability to go through and uh, just really uh, assess the amount of daylighting occurring at each of those different levels. It's just putting a grid down where we can measure each of the different cells. And to use that, what we're going to do is just choose something. I'm not going to grab the window. I'm going to try and grab that floor. I might have to hit the space bar. I'm going to grab the floor. Got it. Okay. And what I'm going to do is go to this blue tab over here where the data analysis grid is available and say, let's auto fit the grid to that. And here's what's going to happen. We can choose within or around, sorry, just within the boundary or kind of encompassing that boundary. There's this notion, is it going to be in the XY plane or the YZ, or choose which plane it is. And there's this notion of how far to offset it. And what that's all about is, when we go through an analog data, we tend not to actually sort of analyze what's happening down here on the floor. You really want to sort of analyze what's happening up here on the work surface. That's really so, that's where this number of about two feet came in. You try to measure it at kind of what's considered a reasonable working height. So I'll say OK to that, and it'll put in a grid, a big blue grid that's just waiting to have some uh, measurement done on it. OK. Once we have a grid in there, we get to decide what it is we want to analyze. And we can analyze the lighting levels. We can analyze the insulation. We can analyze solar radiation and things. We can analyze the spatial comfort. We can actually sort of figure out what the temperature distribution is. Yeah, where people are going to be hot or cold or comfortable or uncomfortable. There are a lot of different sort of things we can do. We're going to go after daylighting. And for daylighting, if we say perform the calculation, you get a whole little wizard that steps you through some different choices. Now let's just step through them once. After that, I'll tend to skip it. But there's the question, is it only natural light, or do we also want to consider electric lights? If you put any, we didn't put any electrical lights in, so no reason to consider that. There's this issue, should we do it over the entire analysis grid or just at some specific points? 
and I'll leave it over the whole grid. How much precision do you want in terms of considering like, oh, where the points of light are coming from? And medium's kind of okay for what we're doing. Don't ratchet it up to full. You'll have to go away and get coffee for half an hour. So kind of keep it to like, uh, high's probably okay. There's this notion of the sky illuminance. And this is one of the things that actually can, is probably the most confusing issue about daylighting. Daylighting, it turns out, is not dependent on a specific time of the year, and it's not dependent on an orientation. To really be fair about daylighting, because we have sunny days and we have not so sunny days, okay. as opposed to sort of really considering the detail of the orientation and like uh, what time of year it is, they normalize it by sort of saying there is just an amount of light in the sky that's just coming uniformly from all directions. And if you think about it, that is true. Even though the sun isn't shining through these windows, we're actually getting a fair amount of light through those windows. It's kind of just ambient light that bounces off things. So there is an amount of light we can consider coming through the building in all directions at all times of the year. And we do it that way, because if I really wanted to make my daylighting look good, I could say, oh, well, I'm going to analyze it on June 21st right at noon, you know, on a very sunny day. Okay, which is probably not a very fair way of looking at things. So there's sort of a norm that is used to analyze the amount of daylighting, which will take out that effect and really just consider the effect of your geometry and the reflectances of your surfaces, and just be fair about how to do the analysis. Okay, so that's what this is all about. And what's happening in here is it's going to compute some sort of illuminance in the sky based on your latitude and longitude and where you're on the Earth. It's like a formula for how you go ahead and figure out how many foot candles, how bright the sun is, basically. And it looks like it's about 789 foot candles, which will give you some sense of really when we're doing foot candles in the room, what you're trying to scale against. Okay. Um, there's this issue, are your windows clean or are they schmutzy? And we'll say clean. Actually, since we're voids, it really won't matter to us because we almost always lose some light through uh, just some scum on the windows. Oh, do we want to use regulatory compliance or increased accuracy mode? If you really want to have something that you could submit to agencies for approval, you should stick to regulatory compliance mode. And then finally, this is just the summary of all that. Let's just say okay. Again, I'll run through that once. After that, you can skip the wizard. You just kind of go through and you'll just keep on using the same assumptions time and time again. Okay, here's what it's doing. It's going through and computing, and what it's doing is trying to figure out for my whole site and all the surfaces, if sunlight's coming and it's bouncing off all those surfaces and reflecting around, it's got to sort of figure out what all those surfaces are and how much light is bouncing off, and ultimately figure out how much light's getting in our space over here. Okay, so even though I'm only considering this range right here, it's actually thinking about light that's bouncing off all those other buildings that are hanging around over there in the ground plane. and It's considering all that in terms of what it's doing. But it's going to basically march the grid. It's being a little slow because I've got a lot of buildings in there. And, you know, if you had only a single building, it would go a little faster in terms of what's going on. But as it goes through, it's going to consider each of these different cells. It's going to figure out the amount of daylighting in there. And then it's going to give you some factor over here. But it's computing first to something called daylighting factor. I'll see it in there. I'll show up there in a second. Daylighting factor is really what is the percentage of daylighting for that space relative to the sun on the outside? Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, assuming for the sake of argument that you built your building on stilts, yes, and you were trying to get reflective light to come from under the floor, mm -hmm. would this also account for that? Let's say, for instance, sure. you decided to install some yeah. glass yeah. Uh, tiles on the floor and have this reflectivity happen from below. Would it? What I think we would want to do then is we want to make sure to actually put a plane at the ground yeah. and that we can assign properties to and reflectance right. to. Yeah. By default, I'm not sure what the ground surface reflectance is considered to be, but to make sure that happens, yeah. And the analysis really would happen from both sides. It's sensitive yes. to both sides. Yes, yeah. It's, it's just, just calculates rays. Exactly. So even the rays that are bouncing off the ground, so I just want to make sure that the ground surface then has a reflectance to right. pop back. Now, that's actually a good strategy for getting light into a lot of buildings. Back into the door. Okay, so what it's doing, it's doing daylighting factors. What's happening is, you can sort of see a little bit about what's happening. We'll scale just a little bit, but as we start out here, right by the windows, we're getting some factor, it looks like it's somewhere around 30, 35% of the full daylighting value. So compared to being out here in the full sun, we're on average, throughout the day, that's about 35% of the total light. What's happening is we get further back into the building, you'll see that it's gonna get sort of a little bit darker, a little bit darker. Yeah. You assign properties to the plane that the light is bouncing off of, say it's water. 
Yes. So, yeah, because really for any of the different surfaces, we just need to come up with a material and figure out what we think the reflectance is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so you know, we need to find a water surface or water material. Yeah, that would work. Okay. So it's going to go through, oh, it's being really slow because I have too much building going on. So it's going to keep values in a couple of different ways. One way of presenting it to us is thing called daylighting factor. Daylighting factor is a percentage of the full sun. Okay. Um, we'll scale out to that. The other thing you can show us is something called the uh, no, daylight factor is the percentage. Daylighting is it's an absolute value of either foot candles or lux. Okay, and it'll show you just how much light is sort of being reached into those different surfaces. Just so you have a standard of comparison. Yeah, you know, thirty percent is actually very, very bright. You know, as when you're close to being outside, and what's going on. If you want to get LEED certification, okay, you have to show that in your building, at least seventy-five percent of the area, okay, is daylight at least two percent daylight factor. Okay, so it doesn't have to be very, very bright right. in order to really achieve what the target level is. So two you percent know, isn't all that hard to achieve. If you have at least some penetrations between the outside, you get some sort of daylight in there. In terms of thinking in terms of foot candles, what happens is you have to apply all sorts of published rules, but generally, when I'm walking down the corridor and I'm not really doing any work, I'm just sort of passing through space, people will tell you, oh, 40 to 50 foot candles is bright enough for a space like that. Okay. For a workspace, for something like that, I'm going to be in here working on paper and I need to see things pretty clearly. People will say, oh, 80 or 100 foot candles. There's all sorts of recommendations about what that should be, and you find it's actually it's even sensitive to things like, you know, we give different recommendations for different ages of people. Mm. So for like you guys, okay, you guys can theoretically work in a darker space and it doesn't bother you nearly as much, where older people tend to need a lot more light to actually sort of see things because the visual acuity isn't as good. So it's even sort of, yeah, it's, 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 it's depending on a lot of different things. What you need to understand though is, if you have a space that starts having more than like 150 foot candles or something like that, it's kind of like being under the intense glare of the interrogator's lamp where it's just looming on you over here. And somehow that's just really not a very comfortable space to be all day long. So when you start having that much brightness, you want to think about the other thing. And you may have this, like in my building, i got so much open glass. I don't have a daylighting problem. I have a shading problem. I have the other issue. I need to actually be thinking about how to cut out some of that light because otherwise people are just sweating and sweltering and they're not comfortable in this space. Okay, oh, I have too much going on here. It's being so slow. I have to have a pretty fast machine. Okay, so it'll show us these different little grids. Let's just go ahead and as, as it's doing all that as a computer, let me answer some questions because we're kind of doing some of that stuff. So in terms of daylighting in this grid, like, yeah, you're looking at this, is that all, yeah, is it clear? What, what are some things that you're sort of you're thinking about how to apply that to your building? These are your questions. Does that all sort of make sense enough? If you want to. Why don't you have a way for that to do it? Why don't you try it on your building if you have something in there? Let's see if we can go ahead and, like, uh, if you got a building, let's see if we can apply a, gr uh, a daylighting. Uh... Okay, you got all sorts of views. Why don't you go ahead and just try? Let's go to the blue tab. The blue tab is the one that's like the daylighting grid. Okay, and what you want to do is you want to choose some ground surface. Go into your building and see if you can kind of choose one of those ground surfaces. There you go. You got that? There you go. And now say, Okay. And I say auto fit and grid. And say, wait a minute. Okay, so that's getting around the bounds there. It looks like there's some more stuff going in the middle. That's okay to get started. Type of finish within? Yeah, generally go within. You go around. It may be having a little trouble in terms of how the building is parsed up, but that's okay. Even for those as grid cells, we can go ahead and analyze them. But if you have a grid in at least a part of your building, don't worry if you don't have the whole building because we can do it in sub pieces. Go on down to the part at the bottom where it says perform calculation. So right down to the very bottom. And just kind of step through that wizard and then say, let's run the analysis. And say, okay, so at the bottom there, say perform calculation. And just kind of step through the wizard. Oh, we can literally blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, uh, 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 you do a little bit of your 
Here's an actually a lot faster than mine because uh, it's just like some flexi efficient data. Just let it kind of cook around. Yours may be a little bit slower. It's, it's dependent on how many searches there are to reflect the light off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so grab the searches. Okay, we're there. Okay, great. So you were just going to Right, so these are the sandwiches, right? Oh, so now it's a little bit too much. Well, it's a little bit too much. How do we translate the percentage? Uh, do we, do we uh, just go online and try to find the conversion from a percentage? Someone's put it in the daylight language? Uh, actually, no, it's, it's really built right in here, so let's talk about that. Okay, yeah. so you guys are going. So, I think you can sort of see this is my daylighting factors. I got percentages, I got some dark areas, like pretty bright around the outside. Okay, so daylighting factor is right there, and you can scale this if you want to. Let's just kind of show you that. It sort of scales from the high to low values. But if you want to sort of do something like, oh, can I put contours in there? Let me kind of show you some things in here. I can show contour lines, which will serve sort of more smooth contours. Values will actually show us the data values, and I tend to say only the peaks and the troughs. Okay, that'll put some just data in there. Okay, and then even in here, this is one that you may or may not like. If you say show values in 3D, it'll sort of like really scale up or scale down, depending on what you want. Okay, but you can go ahead and sort of set those things in there. That'll just sort of give you a sort of a visualization of what's going on. You can make the contours very fine or not. Okay. And you can even do this thing, and this is one thing that I really like to do, someone at, at Penn State showed me how to do this, it's that you can clip things. So for example, if you have a minimum that you're interested in, if you're only interested in show me everything that is above 20% or something like that, I can say put in a minimum of 20, okay, and then clip to the minimum, and it'll show me only the things that are above 20. This will now show me everything that's above 30. And you can really sort of focus in on specific areas. So it's just a visualization tool. Use it to kind of really uh, try to get to whatever uh, is going to help you in terms of doing your design. So daylighting factor is the percentages. The other piece of it, though, if you want to think of it in terms of lux or lumens, is daylighting levels. In daylighting levels, well, that'll do the conversion. It'll go from the percentages to the foot candles itself. Great. Yeah, so there is a formula for doing that, but it's sort of built right in there. So I can see right away that right here by my windows, I got 300 foot candles right at the edge. Back in the, in the middle, it's still 150, but I would definitely say my building has too much light coming in around the edges. It's kind of tolerable in the middle, but it's definitely a little bit too bright in the center. Just because I got, I got the judgment Okay, so one issue we're going to think about is this whole notion of just the uh, daylighting levels and computing the numerics. And that's really, you know, one really good thing to get started with. So that's one aspect of it. But the other thing we'll go ahead and show you, and then we'll let you kind of take off for today, is the issue of just the solar rays and understanding how they're bouncing around. So let's give you a real quickie on that. Because that's the other side of the equation you may want to understand. And here's how it basically works. Okay. I will go ahead and just kind of turn off my grid right now. Oh. And I'm going to go back to, uh, well, let me do it a number of different ways. Hang on here, let me go to visualization. What I want to do is actually understand just the daylighting or that the, the rays, the solar rays that are sort of bouncing around inside this building. Okay, and in order to go ahead and understand the solar rays that are bouncing around, I really have to tell it which surfaces I want to consider the bouncing off of. Okay, because otherwise there's just so many rays, it's really hard to figure out what it is you want to do. And what I'm going to do is actually try and choose just again that floor surface. And what I'll do is go to the Sun tab, and I'll just say, let's make that a reflector. Okay, and when you do that, you're saying basically, show me what's happening with all the rays that are sort of would hit that surfaces, that surface, and what happens after they bounce off that surface. Okay, so I made it a reflector. So far, nothing's going on. I can say, show the solar rays. 
can. This will be a little dense right now, then I'll sort of go ahead and like uh, make it a little less dense in a second here. <laughs> it's really dense over there in terms of building up. But what I want to do is make, turn that off. Now it's still it's doing it. What I should do is I don't want to show the solar rays every three inches because that's my model's much too big for that. Is basically go ahead and say show it oh you know, every foot or every two feet or something like that. What I'm going to do over here is oh uh, just sort of play with the date and time. It's 8:30 in the morning, which is a little bit early. Let me pan this around a little bit. Okay, if I go to oh eight nine. And again, let me sort of space this out a little further so you can actually get a better sense of what's going on. Maybe even three. Let me orbit this around and pan this and start to get a better sense. Even a little more orbiting. In a sec, in a minute, I'm going to cut a section, which will just. <laughs> Probably the easiest way to see this. Okay. So here's what's going on, and I'll make it to four. You can see that what's basically going on here in the building is at this time of day in March, we got a lot of solar rays. They're coming in through the big window on the front, they're hitting the ground here. I'm not showing any bouncing yet. You can see there's actually some rays coming in back in here too. And where those are coming from is not just from the big window, actually, that's the effect of little skylights. All those teeny tiny little skylights, there's some light coming back in here. Now we can start to think about that one bounce. This is just sort of where the sunlight's coming directly. If I say show two bounces, it'll show the reflection off the surface, and you can actually see where we're hitting the floor and we're coming up and hitting the ceiling. And if you say three bounces, you can actually see where you're hitting the floor, you're hitting the ceiling, and then you're coming back down in again. So here, up here, and back down again. Yeah. This is kind of a funny thing about geometry you need to sort of think about in terms of your daylighting is that daylighting is very susceptible. All these reflectances depend on the instant angle at which the rays hit. So at this time of day, we come down, we bounce off. What happens is when we're hitting the ceiling, because the ceiling is sloped, it doesn't actually bounce back to the back of the room it actually reflects back down this way. So you have to start thinking about this in terms of your daylight, because it's, there's two things that are really sort of affecting more anything. The color, the reflectance and the kind of color of the surface, in terms of how much is actually reflecting off there. Then it's this angling thing. So even in big spaces like this that have big surfaces that are kind of sloping like that, you'll often start to see now floating panels or different baffles that are there that are really just providing reflecting surfaces. Because you want to control the direction in which those reflect. Because if this is coming up here, as opposed to reflecting down off that, if there's a horizontal surface, it will reflect back that way instead. So you want to start playing around with that. It's not only just the amount coming through, it's really how effective your geometry is about reflecting it back into that. Okay, now just to kind of give you a sense of how you can kind of control this, let me go ahead and turn off the solar rays and I will uh, kind of just do something at the front of the building here. Then let you go. See if I can pan that around. If, for example, I wanted to go through and put in like a solar shelf or something like that, I can go back and model that in Revit and do something like that. Let me see if I can actually just model it here. Just so you get a sense of uh, what's going on. I just did my little quick model of a solar shelf. Let's see if that actually worked. I think it's actually there. I think I actually managed to get it in the right place. Okay, maybe I don't visualize it. Yep, looks good. Okay, let me go ahead and take that thing and make it a solar reflector also. So I'll say over here, um, tag the selected objects, I'll make that a reflector. Okay, let me show the solar rays here. Okay, so zoom on in and we'll take a look at how well that is doing as a solar feature. You'll see that that shelf is actually pretty effective. Let me pan that around. Okay, for getting the light in, let's see what's happening where it's actually just reflecting off the ceiling and it's not getting very good well into space at this time of day. 
It's going to have a different effect. Let me go to December, for example, when we have the long low shadows. No, not very good there either. Even here in terms of January, it's not very good, at least not at 10.30 in the morning. I can sort of rotate through. At this point, because the ceiling is so or is sloped, it's actually just reflecting right back out the windows. It's not doing me any good at all at like a one in the afternoon. That may actually be a good effect, actually. It depends on what you're trying to do, whether you want to get the, solar, or the, the sunshine in there or not. Here, the sun's getting back in the sky, so we're not getting any at that point in terms of what's going on. Can you see the, the reflectivity of the floor and the shelf at the same time? Or? Yes, let's go ahead and do that. So to do that, let's go to 3D Editor. I'm going to turn off the solar rays for a second. We'll choose that guy. And we'll also see if I can get that floor too. Is it control or is it shift? No, that's the wall. Hang on, let me orbit a little. Okay, let's try this again. Let's get the floor. And let's see if I can get that. Okay, got the two of them. Okay, great. We'll say tag them both. Okay, and now let's show the solar rays. Okay. Can you get the effect of both? Kind of the direct sun coming in. Let's go ahead and space this out even further so it's not looking quite so dense. Six foot. And maybe even only go down just two rays worth, or two bounces worth, so you can sort of see what's happening here. So now you're starting to see, okay, we got the two different effects. Yeah. Sun coming in, bouncing up, hitting the back of the building. This coming up, kind of reflecting the front of the building. But really, to be very effective about this, I might want to think about some sort of horizontal surface or some other sort of surface that will let it catch the light and reflect it back in there to really get back into space as opposed to just having that big ceiling in there. So this is like a big aha to use this pool. But I love the idea of these big clear story spaces and kind of sloping ceiling. You think, oh, we're getting all this light in there. It's sort of great from sort of a daylighting perspective, but it isn't. Because you're not actually, I guess what it is, capturing light doesn't do a whole lot of good if you don't reflect it. Because that's my takeaway from all this. So you got to think about not only capturing, but once you get it into the building, how you actually reflect it back and get it back into the core. Because the two have to work together, or you don't really have an effective strategy. Okay, that's it in terms of the big high level for all this stuff. Thank you for patiently sticking with all this stuff. Um, and we love the light with it. Yeah. And anyway, as you get going with all this, we will send out links to these videos that kind of explain all this stuff. Uh, and I'll send them to Larry and he can redistribute yeah. them. And you can send it to Joy and myself and we'll you know, redistribute it to everybody else. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Awesome.